we start? Yeah. Hi. Um, as you already heard, my name is Ketan Vajabargia, and uh, I'm here to talk about TLS in the home lab, the easy way and the hard way. Before we begin, a very quick intro about myself. So before we begin, a really quick intro about myself. At work, I'm a principal engineer in AWS. Specifically, I work in the artificial intelligence and machine learning organization. And I help build products which simplify machine learning development in the cloud. Outside work, I enjoy self-hosting as a hobby. And one of the primary reasons I do self-hosting is uh, because I care about having control over my data. Uh, I also care a lot about security, uh, both at work and uh, uh, in self-hosting. So this talk is uh, some outcome of uh, that interest. I'm also a first time speaker here at Linux Fest, so I'm really excited to be here. This talk is about a couple of things. One is I wanted to talk about three approaches of implementing TLS and in increasing order of complexity. I also didn't want this talk to just be a theoretical discussion. So I also wrote some uh, code, the minimum that I could write, to demonstrate these concepts. Uh, towards the end, end of the talk, we'll look at the code a little bit. Uh, but my hope is that if you look at the code later on, uh, if you enjoy the talk, uh, you should be able to recreate uh, these approaches in whatever setup uh, you have. This talk is not about a few things. I won't go too much into the low-level details of uh, TLS handshake. I also won't talk about the cryptographic algorithms or the math behind those uh, as part of the talk. I also don't want to give software recommendations today. Um, even though I used some software or some open source projects to implement my code, I really want to focus on the uh, concepts behind uh, the three approaches that I want to talk about uh, so that uh, you can replicate those in whatever stack you happen to run. Before we begin, what is TLS? very briefly. So TLS stands for Transport Layer Security. And what it allows is two parties, typically a client and a server, to securely communicate with each other. So for example, if a TLS connection has been set up between uh, two parties, no other party can either intercept the connection or tamper with the information that these two parties are exchanging with each other. For example, if you run a Nextcloud server at home, your Nextcloud is a server. And if you use a, a web browser or mobile apps to access Nextcloud, that's your client. TLS, TLS should not be confused with HTTPS. So once a TLS connection is set up, and if the client simply uses HTTP to talk to the service, that's HTTPS. So essentially, HTTPS is a application layer uh, protocol, just HTTP over on top of TLS. And there are other examples of such application layer, uh, layer protocols. For example, there is IMAPS. Uh, IMAP is something you use, a, a, a client uses to access emails from an email server. So if you do IMAP over TLS, that becomes IMAPS, similar to HTTPS. Also, TLS should not be confused with SSL. SSL was a technology that used to provide a similar transport la layer encryption. But it is now deprecated, and TLS is a direct successor of that. However, some people do talk about SSL uh, today. And if they talk about SSL, they probably mean TLS. Um, so somewhat, these terms are somewhat uh, used interchangeably. We'll also talk a little bit about encryption. And so I wanted to introduce uh, a couple of terms uh, around it. One is uh, public key cryptography, or 
asymmetric cryptography. This is a style of encryption which relies on something called public-private key pairs. So imagine if I create a public-private key pair and I hand over the public part of the key pair to you, you can use that public key to encrypt any piece of data in such a way that only I, who has access to the private key, can decrypt it. Nobody else who doesn't have access to the private key will be able to decrypt it. So this is public key cryptography. Then there is symmetric key cryptography, uh, where the encryption and decryption happens with a single key. So you and I would need to have access to the same key so that if I encrypt something with the key, you will be able to decrypt it with the same key and vice versa. So with that in mind, let's talk about the first approach, which uses self-signed self certificates. So certificates are a key part of uh, TLS encryption. And they are essentially a way for an entity, like the server in this case, to establish its identity. So in this approach, as the name suggests, a server would just generate a certificate out of thin air and would try to use that for encryption. Now, to take an example, if I have a website running at my home and I generate a self-signed certificate claiming I'm Amazon.com, if I somehow make a browser connect to my website, it shouldn't work. Like the browser should complain to you that you think you are trying to connect to Amazon.com, but this is not what it uh, claim. The, uh, the website is not what it claims to be. So it's not. So there are limitations to where you can use self-signed certificates, but they are useful in some places, and they are also very easy to implement. In practice, this is how it would look like. So if you look at the left image, when a browser tries to connect to such a website, uh, the browser will complain that, hey, I don't know what the certificate is. So your com connection may not be private. If you go and inspect the certificate in the browser, it says the same thing. Uh, it shows uh, on the right-hand side that the server is using a self-signed certificate. But the connection is still encrypted as you can see on the uh, on the top on the right hand side apart from what we discussed one thing to also keep in mind is this approach doesn't scale very well so for example if you have five services and 10 clients each of these five services might generate its own self signed certificate and now you need to deploy this five uh, certificates on each of these 10 clients. If you add a service or if you add clients, you need to do the same process again. So it doesn't scale very well. To mitigate that, this is where the, uh, the second approach comes into picture, where you use something known as a certificate authority or a CA. So essentially CA is a trusted entity that can vend out valid certificates. So if you look at this image, there are a few things going on here. First, if you look at the server, the server first needs to prove to the CA that it is asking for a certificate for a domain that it is authorized to uh, get a certificate for, or a domain that it has control over. So for that, the server can use something known as an ACME protocol, where the server can prove its identity through what is known as uh, challenges. So there are three types of challenges which ACME supports, uh, HTTP challenge, TLS challenge, and DNS challenge. So server can use one of these three to prove to the CA that it has access to this domain and if it is not able to prove, then it will not get a valid certificate. So to my example from earlier, if I try to get a certificate for, my for a website which is running at my home for amazon.com, uh, ACA will not uh, 
give that certificate, uh, give, a, give a valid certificate. On the left-hand side, the CA also needs to be somehow trusted on the clients. And there are a few different ways of doing that. Um, some browsers shift with their own uh, uh, list of uh, trusted certificates. Uh, an example is Firefox. In other cases, uh, the trust relationship could be set up through the operating system. Like the operating, sy operating system would have its own set of uh, trusted root certificates. And then there are browsers like Safari who just depend on the uh, system level uh, trust store. So this is the case for what are known as public uh, CAs. If you also happen to run a custom CA, uh, you would have to set up the trust relationship either manually or through some automation. But going back to the problem from earlier, you can see that this approach scales much better. Because now, if you have five servers or your 10 clients, they all need to set up a single trust relationship with the CA. And if you add more servers, uh, services or uh, clients, you just need an additional trust relationship with the CA. So within this approach, we'll look at two approaches. Uh, the first one uses a public CA, like uh, Let's Encrypt. So if you look at the image, uh, the, the connection just works because Let's Encrypt is trusted on most systems nowadays. If you ins inspect, a, uh, inspect the certificate, you will see that it was indeed issued by Let's Encrypt. If you fire a curl command uh, to, the, to the HTTPS endpoint, that also just works because the trust relationship is already there on your system. A couple of things to keep in mind if you use a public uh, CA. One is uh, some, like, like let's encrypt uh, as an example, issues certificates which are only valid for 90 days. So you should look at what those val validities are for depending on the uh, public CA that you are using. In the case of let's encrypt, uh, 90 days is not too bad because in my opinion, it makes you think about automation and having, in, ha having it in place uh, from the get-go. For example, some reverse proxies like traffic or caddy already have inbuilt support for uh, automatic uh, certificate renewal. The other, other thing to keep in mind is that these certificates are logged publicly. Um, so there is this website where you can look at any domain to see all the certificates that, all the certificates that were generated for it through uh, a public CA. There is some mitigation for that if you want to use, if you use wildcard certificates. So essentially, let's say you had a certificate for example.com. You can also add a secondary to that for star.example.com. So now you can use a certificate for any subdomain of example.com. And even though the public log shows that you got a certificate for example.com and its wildcard, the, all these subdomains for which you use uh, the certificate, that's not publicly logged. To get that, to, to, to do that, you need to you need you need to use uh, one of the uh, you need to use the DNS challenge uh, as part of ACME. Um, and on a very high level, what it means is that while as part of ACME, you need to modify some DNS records through your DNS provider's API to establish the uh, uh, to. Verify uh, to prove that you indeed control the uh, DNS for the domain that you are asking uh, a certificate for. And another benefit of DNS challenge is that you don't need to expose port 80 or 443 uh, to get these certificates. So if you are running uh, some services uh, behind a firewall, uh, DNS challenge works really well uh, 
in those cases. So that's why I implemented DNS challenge uh, in the uh, a company code uh, that I shared earlier. As for a custom CA, this is how it looks in practice. So on the left hand side, you can see that the browser still complains at the start, saying that, hey, I don't know what the certificate is for. But you can establish a trust relationship with the root certificate, as shown in the second image. And once you use do that, uh, the uh, browser uh, st stops complaining. So considerations with uh, the custom CA, if you look at the first curl command, um, you need to specify the root certificate to establish a valid connection. So this is, this is the root certificate which was vented by the custom CA. But if you look at the second command, I specified an insecure parameter and that also works. So what happened there? For that, we need to look at something which we haven't talked about just yet. So on a high level, this is how a TLS handshake works. Um, in the first step, the client wants to connect to a server. And in the second step, the server presents a TLS certificate. In the third step, the client verifies the uh, uh, certificate uh, uh, against uh, one of the root certificates that it has access to. Now by this step, a few things have happened. One is the client and server have negotiated the TLS version that they are going to use. For example, the latest one right now is 1.3, but a lot of websites are still using 1.2, which is the previous version. So the client and server in this session have negotiated what version they're going to use. They would have also negotiated the cipher or the cryptographic algorithm that they're going to use. Um, the client would have used the uh, 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 certificate to verify the uh, server's identity. And then it can use the public key out of that certificate to use asymmetric cryptography to send a encrypted message to the server. Now, asymmetric cryptography is, com uh, is expensive uh, in terms of computation. So it is only used at the start of the TLS uh, setup. But as part of this negotiation, the client and server would also uh, arrive at a common, what we know, call as a session key. And they will start using a, a like, symmetric key encryption using that negotiated uh, session key to start talking to each other. So at step four, the TLS connection has been set up and the communication is uh, encrypted. But if you notice closely, it is only the client that verifies the server's identity. And in many cases, that is sufficient. For example, if I connect to Amazon.com, I as a client need to know that I am indeed connecting to Amazon.com and not a malicious uh, uh, server. If on the other hand, Amazon wants to know who I am, let's say to show, my, show me my order history, it can use it can ask me to log in and use that application uh, level of authentication to know my identity. However, if there are cases where you want to disallow some clients to even connect to you, this approach doesn't work. So this is a setup that, that I used to run in my uh, home uh, in the past, where I had a few services which I wanted, which I, which I exposed to the, to the public internet through a reverse proxy on port 80 and 443. Out of those, some services I wanted to keep publicly available. For example, a Nextcloud server, which uh, I would sometimes use to share files or folders with 
uh, family or friends. So I wanted it to be publicly available. But then there were some uh, services which I wanted to keep private. An example is image, which is like a Google Photos like uh, uh, self-hosted software. And I knew that I only wanted a very small number of clients or devices, such as my devices or my wife's devices to connect to the image server, even though the server was exposed to the public internet. And this is where mutual TLS comes into picture. So if you look at the image, all the steps until step three are the same, but there are a few new steps. For example, in the fourth step, the client also needs to specify its own certificate. And in step five, the server would verify the client's certificate. If the client could not present a valid certificate, the server would reject the call or re reject the handshake. Only if the verification succeeded, the server would uh, allow the client to establish uh, a connection. So if you, if, you, if you can imagine, this authentication happens even before, as part of the TLS handshake itself, so even before uh, an application level authentication uh, can happen. So a device which you don't want to connect will not even be able to set up a connection or access anything uh, uh, from, uh, from the server. This is how the mutual TLS setup looks like. Most of the components are the same as earlier, but there is a new uh, uh, component here where the client also needs to get valid client certificates from the CA. And this is what it will use as part of the mutual uh, TLS handshake. In practice, if you try to connect to a website which uh, implemented, which implements mutual TLS, the browser will complain that the website needs a valid client certificate. And in this case, Safari uh, shows if the, the list, uh, the few client certificates that it has access to, to help you choose one of those to uh, set up a connection. If you look at the curl command, you still need to specify the root certificate, but you now also need to specify the client certificate. The insecure parameter that I showed earlier, that won't work anymore. What are some things to keep in mind if you do implement a custom CA? One is you need to manage root certificates on all your clients, which means you need to install, trust, and periodically update uh, those certificates. You can, of course, automate that process, but that is something that you need to take care of. If you happen to use mutual TLS, um, that you need to do, do the same thing for client certificates as well. In my experience, I also had some trouble making a reverse proxy like traffic work for public and custom CA in the same instance. For example, what I saw was that a public service, like a service which I expected to use uh, certificates from a public CA, traffic in some, in, in some situations would suddenly switch to uh, certificates vended by my custom uh, CA, and that, would, uh, and that broke uh, the, uh, some of the mobile apps. It, I could have solved that problem, but uh, I didn't investigate too much about it. Nowadays, I just rely on uh, a public CA like uh, Let's Encrypt, because it's easy, and for services which I want to keep private, I simply use uh, IP-based uh, allow listing from my LAN network. If I do want to access these websites or these services when I'm 
away from home. Um, I just VPN into my home network. <clears throat> like I mentioned before, uh, the code which I used to prepare or prepare uh, the demos in this uh, talk, they're available here on GitHub. And I pretty much used uh, open source software to implement that. For example, I used uh, Traffic, which is a open source reverse proxy. And uh, it also handles certificate management through ACME. I used Docker for uh, spinning up uh, the demo services. I got a free uh, domain from DuckDNS. Um, as for the public CA, I used uh, Let's Encrypt, which allows you to get free certificates um, and is a uh, non-profit organization whose uh, certificates are uh, uh, trusted on many systems uh, nowadays. As for uh, a custom CA, I used an open source software called uh, Step CA. As I said earlier, these are not my recommendations. These are just things that I happen to run uh, in my home lab. But I hope that the concepts are reusable and uh, you should be able to implement those uh, in your own setup. With that in mind, um, if you'd like to contact me, uh, here's a link to my website which has a few different ways of connecting with me. And uh, thank you for uh, listening. And I can take a few questions if you have time. So the, uh, that CRT, that SH site that you showed earlier, is that something that's run by Let's Encrypt, or is that somebody that's just connecting to Let's Encrypt data? You know? I don't know. But I've actually seen, uh, so the question is, uh, is uh, CRT.SH CRT run by Let's Encrypt or not? I don't know the right answer, but what I've seen is that it does have a log of certificates from public websites like Amazon.com and others. So I suspect it is not just Let's Encrypt, because I know Amazon.com does not uh, use Let's Encrypt. So, so it's using publicly available data to uh, I think so, yes. Yeah, step CA, the custom CA, does that support the ACME protocol? It does, yeah. Okay. So that is what I used here. Um, it does support ACME protocol. Okay. Yep. Um, on your mutual TLS slide, that had more steps. Um, is, that, is, that like, is that TLS version 1.3 specifically? So the question is, mutual TLS, is that specifically to TLS, TLS 1.3? I don't think so. I don't think it is tied to a tied to TLS 1.3, okay. but I don't know how back it goes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, quick question: So, with mutual TLS, uh, do I understand correctly that essentially the server just verifies that the client got the certificate from a trusted CA? So there is no specific client authentication it comes <coughs> afterwards after the TLS handshake was established, right? Right. So the as part of the TLS handshake, the server just verifies, like you said, uh, whether a certificate came from a CA that it also trusts the server. And if that succeeds, the TLS hand uh, connection would be set up. And then any application level authentication would come into picture. Uh, yep. Okay. So my, my question is a little bit, um, if you're setting your home network up for access to family and friends, you want to keep it private. There. You mentioned the 90 days of the certificate expired. And your family and friends, they, they access your network and they get the nasty message in the browser that the, you know, HTTPS is not. You've got to click through it to get that nasty red message from Chrome or whatever browser you're using. Um, that, that really tells you that you either have, you don't have it set up correctly or your certificate expired. Is that the that, that is correct, yeah. So your certificates have expired, and that's what that's one cause for that uh, message. Um, 
there are like two approaches you can do. Like you can get a long lived certificate, but uh, as I said, Let's Encrypt has a upper cap of 90 days. So you, you could use something else. But then I think the downside there is that it does not force you to think of automated certificate management. So you need to keep a reminder for yourself if you miss uh, that same issue would come up again. Just go over that part again and what, what you recommend, the techniques you recommend for your, for your automation. So Acme is, Acme, Acme and uh, some reverse proxies like uh, Traffic and uh, Caddy. They have built-in support for running Acme at a sh at the right schedule. So they know that, so let's say I use traffic and it got a certificate which is valid for 90 days. It would know that this certificate will now expire in 90 days. So when, um, let's say 30 days are remaining, it will slowly, it, it will st try to renew at a cadence. So if it go, what, was able to renew in the first attempt, great. You have 90 days more. If that failed for some reason, it will try again once every day for a few days. And if you only have seven days remaining, it will try more frequently. And if you, let's say, just have 24 hours remaining, it will try, I think, every hour or something like that. So it will take care of automating at the right cadence for you. Uh, that's one way. So it's traffic itself that's rotating the cert and not some other process like a script or something? In my demo, yes. Right. You could also have something else, but in my demo, yes. Right. So it just takes out the automation complexity uh, for you. I think you were first. Sorry. Yeah. Um, with, you were saying uh, for the server to get a, a certificate from the public uh, CA, you have to do the acne verification, right? But for the client side, like when you're doing mutual PLS, uh, is there any kind of like uh, verification or how, how does that work? Uh, yeah, it also needs, uh, even clients need to prove to the custom CA that they are authorized. So there are a few different uh, techniques for that. Uh, the one that I used was the simplest one. Like, uh, since I was doing it at a very small scale, I just used what is known as, a, what is a admin password on the custom CA to generate a client certificate and I quote unquote deployed it on the client uh, manually. But as you can imagine, that won't scale. Uh, so there are a few different techniques. Uh, I believe there is one which uses, let's say, uh, for example, OIDC. So if there is a uh, 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 identity provider which the client can uh, talk to, uh, it can prove its identity through that to get a valid certificate at, at some cadence. So there are a few different uh, ways. I, I, I guess you were first. Um, yeah, this might be uh, going out of scope. So I use Let's Encrypt. I've got a bunch of sites that are public. Move them all to HTTPS. Um, and I guess I use DNS challenge, right, where it's asking me to create a TXT uh, domain on the website to prove that I own that domain. And then I have to wait. So normally it takes about a minute for that new uh, text record to show up. And then it asks me to do it again. It always does, so I guess everybody sees this. And that one, I don't see. I'm, I'm running dig on several different machines. I'm using the Google uh, domain checker. And it doesn't show up. And yeah. It might be because I guess I'm using Namecheap and they are uh, letting me create uh, one text record fairly quickly, but then they throttle so you can't create a whole bunch. Yeah, I've seen that too, and what I've seen is that that is dependent on your DNS provider. So when I've used Cloudflare, that's that works awesome. Like it works very fast, and there is no delay as such that uh, I have seen myself. Yes. But uh, then there is another DNS provider, uh, DSEC, D-E-S-E-C, that makes me, that wants me to wait, I think a minute or five uh, before uh, before things succeed. So 
short answer is I think it's it depends on the DNS provider uh, that you are using. So, so the second question, this is really going in the scope in a way. Um, the the uh, Let's Encrypt gives you a script to just let you automate once you have a search place. <coughs> and it's close to 90 days, so you've got to refresh it. You really don't want to go past the 90 days because yep. it's really tough then. Uh, I've never been able to get that refresh script to work. And I'm sorry, I don't have an error message. I don't know really the question is, did anyone else, is anyone else here in that situation? Yeah, I've never used that script myself, but if anyone knows. Okay, yeah, I mean, so I always have to do the, create the text record every time. Maybe. I was curious, when you mentioned the three kinds of challenges, how did the other two work? Okay. So for the, for the other two, you just <coughs> need to expose those ports to the public internet. If you want to do them behind a firewall, uh, it, it, they, they, they don't work. OK, so when I do Kubernetes work, I'm using really hogging stuff. But we have lots of time. Um, so I, I use the Helm chart from Jetpack to install Cert Manager, which is a wrapper array of Let's Encrypt. And that, that all works fine with Kubernetes. So I guess that's what it's doing, to say, yes, I own this domain. It's something that the Kubernetes server has created. And so that's all happening under the covers. There's no need with Cert Manager to create a text record. Possibly. OK. I've not, I've not done that, so I can't speak to it. If you're in Kubernetes, it's great. Someone say about traffic and caddy. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Maybe automation. What was the other one you mentioned? Caddy. And that's also a reverse proxy. Yep. Um, so it, for mutual TLS, is a custom CA required? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So with how hard it is to manage client certificates, what are the what would you recommend in TLS over like application authentication? Um. I couldn't find a good way to automate the client-side uh, certificate management. Maybe I didn't look hard enough, or I just don't know a good way of uh, automating that part. And uh, that is a concern that I had uh, when I first implemented Mutual TLS. Um, I didn't want to you know, hand manage on uh, the certificates on a bunch of devices. Um, if I had a good way of doing that, uh, I guess that would have been one uh, ma major requirement. The other would have been uh, the apps uh, should have been working f fine in all the cases. Like I remember, mm -hmm. I, I think Home Assistant app didn't work well. Uh, or I might be misremembering, but uh, some of the apps did not work well. Um, so if those two things were sorted, I would have uh, chosen uh, virtual TLS uh, for, for my own setup. But I moved away from that because I didn't have a good solution for both of those problems. Yeah. 